Hello. I'm back. Uh, let me put my microphone here. Terrible lighting. It's very harsh. Um, I um, had been going out this evening, but uh, unfortunately a combination of me feeling a little bit dicky and um, not quite being up to it uh, has meant I'm going to stay in. So I'm doing an impromptu stream on a Friday, which is a really bad time to do a stream if you haven't advertised it with a small channel like mine, uh, which is why no one's watching yet. Um, but that's okay. Oh, hold on. Woohoo. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to um, I'm going to be playing Shadow of the Giants, and uh, this is um. Much like the the Lone Wolf, it's a fighting fantasy uh, book. Um, the fighting fantasy was uh, came out slightly ahead of Lone Wolf. Um, was the first choose your own adventure series I ever got. Um, they brought a book out called The Warlock of Firetop Mountain, uh, which was the very first in the series. Now they are also reprinting a lot of their older books and also. Some new ones are coming out. <laughs> Desert Phoenix is here. Even though I didn't advertise this, I knew he would pop on somehow. Uh, good to see you, mate. I think that's a quote from Tron, if I remember rightly. Um, so, um, yeah, anyway, I, I was going out to this evening, but I, I don't feel um, up to it. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my first crack um, at a fighting fantasy book. Now... I'm just um, again. This is this is a little bit impromptu, um, so you know it, it's uh, not planned. Um, and I haven't played a fighting fantasy book for ages, so I'm going to have to go through everything from the top. Um, so I haven't pre-planned the mission or anything uh, to dispense with all the niggles. So unfortunately, you're going to have to. Um, stay online with me <clears throat> and go through all the niggles as well um but uh, if you're up for that so am i so i've got my die roll app ready uh still not quite looking the same as it did for some reason not quite sure why but um so uh, yeah okay six-sided i think you used mainly a six-sided dice with um, Fighting Fantasy, if I remember rightly. Uh, but as I said, I haven't played this in a very long time. Okay, so we are going to dive into Shadow of the Giants. Um, now, I can't uh, tell you anything about the story, um, other than it's got a very cool cover, but it is written by Ian Livingston. And um, back in the day, uh, Ian Livingston and... Steve Jackson were the two big authors of these. Now, I also bought, at the same time I got this, I also bought, oh, hang on, I've got so many things up here, I've got to be a bit careful with this, with this, with this particular shelf area. I've got vinyl records trying to jump off and all kinds of shit going on. So um, I, I did buy another book, uh, which is called The Secrets of Salamonis which is also a new book in the in the series and that's by Steve Jackson. So I think these two are the the, the sort of new ones um in this arena. Jonathan Green, nice to see you. Thanks for popping on. Um hello to you too. So um I keep both of those there for the moment. Um I think my I think the things on my shelf are secure. Thing that, the thing that shouldn't be up up here is actually the, the soundtrack for Born on the 4th of July. So perhaps I should just get that down. Oh, my God. Everything's going to fall down. Now. And these are vinyl records, so I really don't want them to fall down because the records are in now. So, yeah. You know, do your job, SPV. Keep everything, keep everything stable. That's why you're there. Put your tracks down. There you go. All right. Fun times. Right, so soundtrack to born on the fourth of July. Not relevant to this stream. Um pop that there. Stick that back in the box. Okay. 
let's get cracking. So, um, this book, unlike most fighting fantasy books, does actually come with a map. Because that's one of the things I always really liked about the the Lone Wolf books is that they came with a map. And um, I just took a, a, a photo of it. Uh, and uh, it is in the crease of the book. So you'll have to, it's on two pages. So you'll have to forgive the crease. But um, there you go. So I imagine that most of the book is going to be taking place around here. I'm also going to quickly uh, type up a quick banner so we can put it along the page so people know exactly what uh, I'm doing. So, um, but my plan now, I, I played um, uh, some of the last, of the latest Lone uh, Wolf book last night, The Cauldron of Fear. Uh, I'm going to be picking that up again probably around next weekend. Um, so I didn't want to play that um, again without advertising it properly and having having a chance to have a co-host. I might get Desert Phoenix back to play that with me uh, or uh, one of the regulars, depending on who's available. It all comes down to who's available. Uh, I'm just curious to see if in The Secrets of Salamis they also have a map. I just wonder if they have a map in The Secrets of Salamis. In the secrets of Salamis, I don't think they do have a map. Not that I can see. No. Okay. All right. Okay. So these are um, the fighting fantasy books were always a bit bit more simple. I think they were aimed at sort of younger kids than Lone Wolf. Lone Wolf had a, a slightly was aimed at a slightly older, was a little bit more involved. The combat system was a little bit more intricate. Um, so, um, but this is one of the new books. So I've never played this one before. Um, which I think will make it fun. Uh, like fantasy. Choose your own adventure. Oh, let's put by Ian Livingston because we should give him a plug. Now, this book is available, and actually I'll put the link in um, for where you can buy it um, in the blurb later. But it is available on Amazon. So if you want to buy Shadow of the Giants, you can get it. There are 400 numbers in the book, so... Um, uh you know we'll we'll see uh we'll see what happens so i've got 400 sections i can choose from to get through to complete my quest okay all right okay so we're just gonna, gonna whack that on there all right there we go all right so um quite a nice cover i think let's get into it how will you start your adventure Okay, the book you're holding in your hands is a gateway to another world. A world of dark magic, terrifying monsters, brooding castles. Brooding castles? I, I didn't know that castles got broody. Okay, very good. Treacherous dungeons and untold danger. Uh, where a noble few defend against the myriad schemes of the forces of evil. Welcome to the world of fighting fantasy. Okay, so you are embarking on a danger where you're the hero. Okay. Um, if you are new to fighting fantasy, it is a good idea to read through the rules which, ap which appear on page 271 to 279. If you do not have a pair of dice handy, die rolls are printed throughout the bottom of the pages. Flick rapidly. Oh, I see. So you can, you can flip through the pages at random and pick a die roll. So it looks like the die rolls are done on 2d6. So... Um, I want to see if I can, can I, how do I set that up as 2d6? Um, I've got 1d6 here. How do I set up 2d6? Oh, I think I know. You go like 1 and then you, you do a plus here? No. I think so I clear that. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how you do that. Not quite sure how you do that with this app um hang on invite a player no so i don't know it was a bit more obvious when it was the old screen it was all kind of laid out for me so i don't know how i'm gonna do 2d6 how do i do that clear that let's clear that 
Oh, I got it. You just double click on it. Okay, cool. All right. Okay, I got it. We're good. So, 271. I can be quite dumb sometimes. Um, which, when, you know, considering how many scripts I've written, is saying something. <laughs> right. You've been preparing for your quest by practicing your sword play and building up your strength and stamina. Okay. You possess a sword, a backpack containing provisions, food and drink to help you sustain your adventure. Before setting up, you, setting off, you must first roll dice to record your skill, stamina, and luck scores on your adventure sheet. Okay, so this is coming back to me now. So I, I have to have... Uh, thank you for those. There's now seven people watching. That's very nice. Um, I'm playing Shadow of the Giants. The book's here. Um, so... Um, I'm now going to create, um, and it's it's really naff. I'm just doing it in my notes on my Mac. I'm going to create my character sheet here rather than use the one in the book. So I'm going to have stamina, luck, and skill. Okay, all right. So um, stamina, I think, is basically if your stamina goes to zero, um, you die, if I remember rightly. Luck. I've also got a backpack. So I've got a backpack, hopefully not one with kind of a Japanese um, little miniature rabbit on it, on the back of it. Um, okay, so before, so write your score. Okay, okay. To determine your initial skill, stamina and luck scores, roll one dice and add six to this number and enter the total in the skill uh, box uh, on the adventure sheet. Roll two dice and add 12 to this number and enter that into the stamina box, roll one dice, and add six for the luck. Okay. St uh, skill, stamina, and luck scores increase and decrease between your adventure. You may gain skill, luck points, blah, blah, blah. You may never exceed. Uh, initial scores may never be exceeded unless special instructions are given. Okay. All right. So um, uh, when you're told to fight a creature, you must resolve the battle as described below. First, write down the enemy's enemy skill and stamina scores in an empty box. Um, and then roll two dice for the enemy and add the total to its skill score. That's your enemy's attack strength. Roll two dice for yourself. Add that to your current skill. That's your attack strength, whose attack strength is higher. If your attack strength is higher, you have wounded the enemy. If you wound the enemy, subtract two from the enemy's score. Okay. The enemy wounded you, subtract two, make the appropriate changes. This continues until both of you are zero. Zero, okay. Right. So whoever's attack strength is higher basically causes two points of damage. I think I've got all of that. That's fine. So let's, 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 okay, let's roll these skills up. So, and again, normally for people watching, if you come on one of these, I've normally done all this kind of niggle, niggly stuff. Um, before the um, adventure begins, <laughs> go north. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not on Lone Wolf. I'm on um, Shadow of the Giants. So I'm doing a different game today. Lone Wolf is currently on pause. I uh, um, could use it. I, I sorted out the dice. Thanks. Um, so okay. Uh, so we're gonna do our die rolls. Let's uh, let's let's get this uh, die, die rolling app up so you guys can see how I do. All right, so um, I'm going to roll. There was one that was 2d6, so I'll do that first. That's my stamina. Okay, 2d6. We're going to roll that. Let's do that. Uh, you are fucking kidding me. Four. <laughs> Four on top of 12 means my stamina is 16. That's pretty low uh, for this game, if I remember rightly. Um, that's pretty low. That's 16. Okay, now I remember when I played this game before, you were allowed to re-roll something. I don't know whether it was you, you re-rolled one dice of your choice or uh, something like that. So um, uh, if anyone in the chat or if anyone's watching knows if that's a rule still, um, let me know because I'd like to know if I get one re-roll when starting out. Um, let me know. All right. Let's do the others. Uh, so I get stamina, I get 6 plus 1d6. So we'll do... We'll do... Um, oh, hang on. 
sorry, that was stamina that I've just done. Sorry. So skill, I get six plus one D six. Okay. So, uh, all right, let's do, let's do skill. D six, one D six. Okay. So my skill is 12 cause I got a six. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so that's all right. That's 12. And then for my luck, um, maybe just re-roll ones. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess I, we could play it on that role. I mean, so you don't get re-rolls in the game. It's just I remember when you're doing a character sheet, there was one kind of re-roll option. And I have just got a one. Thanks for that. Uh, you cursed me there, Desert Phoenix. So my luck is seven. So I reckon um, if, if uh, I'm allowed a re-roll... Um, I'll either be re-rolling my luck or one of my dice on my stamina because I've got a one and a three on my stamina. I'm going to go through the rest of the stuff first. Skill reflects your swordmanship and fighting expertise. So I'm clearly shit hot with a sword. Um, the higher your stamina, the longer you survive. Luck represents how lucky you are. They increase and decrease. We've got all of that. Um, okay, I suss out how to do combat. I got that. During certain battles, you can escape, but if you do, you lose two stamina. Okay. Various times during the adventure, you'll be told to test your luck. Luck plays a part in deciding what happens. How to test your luck. Roll two dice. If the number rolled is equal or less than your current luck score, you have been lucky. If the number rolled is higher than your current luck score, you have been unlucky. The consequence of being lucky or unlucky will be found in the paragraph you are sent to. Okay. The more you rely on luck, the riskier it becomes. During battles, you have the option of using your luck either to score a more serious wound on a creature or to minimize the effects. If you wound the creature, you may test your luck as, uh, as described above. And if you're lucky, you can subtract an extra two points. So you can do four, so that's, de that's, that's four, four damage instead of two. Okay. But if you're unlucky, then... You must restore one point to the creature's stamina. Okay, so instead of causing um, two points of damage, you've only caused one. If you were wounded by the cre creature, you may um, test your luck and then, okay, if you're unlucky, you subtract an extra, extra stamina point. If you're lucky, you only take one. Don't forget to, to, to subtract one point from your luck score each time you test your luck. Hang on. So each time you test your luck, each time you test your luck, you must subtract one point from your current luck score. The more you rely on luck, the riskier it becomes. Right, okay. Occasionally an event may alter your skill score. But remember, only one weapon can be used at a time. Drinking the potion of skill will restore your skill to its initial level. Okay. Um, this sounds more complicated than Lone Wolf. <laughs> Maybe it is. It's, uh, it is. There's certainly a little, there's a few more things you can do in a battle, I guess. Um, okay, so I look weapons. I'm just going to type out my character sheet here. Um, do that. We've still got six people watching. Thank you very much. Uh, if you're new to the channel, uh, do please subscribe. Um, Choose Your Own Adventure is the only gaming stuff I do. I don't do um, I don't do computer games right now. There's lots of other people doing that. Why why have three D graphics when you can read a book? Um, uh, but I do do a lot of industry interviews, and there are thirty six of them currently on the channel, and some film reviews. You may find those interesting. There's lots of other things as well, but. Um, that's just a brief overview. Okay. Stamina and provisions. You start the game with enough provisions for 10 meals. Okay, right. Yeah, cool. So um, meals 10. Okay, meals 10. And I think every time you, you have a meal, you add four stamina points. So meals also act a bit like lamp spur. Um, add four stamina points. Per meal. Okay. All right. Just writing this down on my character sheet so I don't forget. Um, drinking the potion of luck. Uh, potions. 
You begin your adventure with a sword. So a backpack containing provisions, food, and drink. Okay, so I've got a sword. Right, okay. Sword. And I've got a backpack with a couple of Diet Cokes in it, I assume. Um, right. If I can, can I, can I highlight that? Let me see. No. All right. Just, someone's playing gospel music, like, near me. Okay. Um, so I've got backpack. I've got weapons. Um, well, I've got some weapons. Um, all right. And I've got some meals. Okay, cool. All right. Meals, good. Put that. Actually, somebody might be watching the Whitney Houston biopic, actually, in the apartment above me, because that sounds like maybe that's Whitney Houston playing. Uh, bless her. Do, do, miss, do miss good old Whitney Houston. Um, okay, so Potion of Skill restores your skill points to their initial level. Potion of Stamina, initial level. Potion of Luck, got it. Hints on play. There's only one true way through the shadow of the giants, and it will probably take you several attempts to find it. We'll see about that. Um, good luck on your adventure. May your stamina never fail. Sounds like the Hunger Games. Okay. So um, there is... Um... Hey, Cannoli. How you doing, sir? Um, do you, I don't think you have... A, do you have a stream tonight? I don't think you do. Um, good to see you, mate. Says that Phoenix, this sounds more complicated than Lone Wolf. Yeah, uh, Cannoli, I was supposed to go out tonight, but um, feeling a little bit uh, under the weather. So I'm staying in and doing an impromptu stream. And as I haven't um, scheduled any guests or anything, I think the best thing to do is to do a, a Lone Wolf. Well, it's not a Lone Wolf adventure book, but it's a, it's a Shadow of the Giants fighting fantasy. So by the great Ian Livingston, these books have been going for 40 years now. Um, and there are 21 of them um, currently available, but I think they, they produced about 60 or 70 of them in all. No streams for me. Taking, yeah, well, you should, man. You do a lot of stuff. Plus, you know, you need Mrs. Cannoli uh, shower fun time, as we uh, as we established on the on the previous stream. So, uh, so it's good to take some time off, mate. Absolutely, good some good to take some time off. Uh, I, I don't get out enough myself, but you got understand that all my friends are married with kids, and uh, as much as they love me and I love them, I'm uh, not their family, so um, I come a poor second to them. I am going out with one of my dear friends and her kids tomorrow. I was going to try and take them to see Jurassic Park, which is on its 30th anniversary, and... Um, uh get that ready but um get, get the kids to see jurassic park on the big screen but uh i don't know if that's going to happen um see how i feel tomorrow ah mrs uh mrs sasquatch is here um fresh from preparing the uh, uh arrangements no doubt uh can i have some cannoli please that'd be awesome all right so i'm gonna um Going to give it a go then. I think that's it though. That's 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 it in terms of the stuff I've got. I've got ten meals. I've got a sword. Have sword will travel. Um, so looks like uh, uh, we're uh, <laughs> we're on our way already. Let me put the map back up because I think I might need the map, um, or at least it'll be more interesting for you guys than uh, seeing my mush. All right. So this is the map. It's quite. Um, Quite a good size there. I might zoom in a little bit on it. Okay. I hope that hasn't cut anything out. If it has, I can always zoom out again. Um, thank you to the nine people watching. That's really that's really good. So um, most of the stuff I do on this channel, by the way, is related to kind of film, theatre, and TV. I don't do a lot of gaming stuff most of the time. But um, if I fancy just jumping on, that's why I enjoy doing these choose your own adventure games and um i haven't played a fighting fantasy book in a long time um so this is the first time i've done one of these uh so i've actually seen i put the 90s but it might be the 80s you know and the last time i played one of these might i don't know probably 91 i want to say 91 or 92 um all right okay so 
Let's see what it, 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 it says at the beginning. All right, there's a bit of a story here. Background. Less than a day's walk from Firetop Mountain. Oh, I know it well. I know it well. Anvil is a bustling mining town. So we're looking for Anvil on the map. Oh, I see it. Yes, yes, yes. There it is. There, 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 there. Anvil. Oh, and there's Firetop Mountain. All right, yeah, okay. So there's a few. Th this is actually one of the maps for... Um, where you can see a lot, a lot of the where a lot of the books uh, that, that take place in the world of fighting fantasy or, uh, do take place. I think in this in in the map that you can see here, um, which began Anvil is a bustling mining town which began as a small settlement and grew quickly following the discovery of gold, gold in then their hills, um, in nearby caves, gold in then their caves. The men folk are mostly gold miners, whilst the women folk are lawmakers who meet out tough justice to wrongdoers found guilty of crime, like Mrs. Sasquatch. Um, there was never a lot to do or see in Anvil. No. Visitors were few other than local farmers selling their produce or sneaky thieves who slipped into the town. Sneaky thieves. Are there any other kind? To try their luck on unsuspecting citizens. The only other outsiders in the town were rugged dwarf miners hiding from nearby Stonebridge with its stony bridge. Eager to shake hands with everybody, the dwarves would greet people with outstretched hand and a beaming smile. The residents soon learned to avoid their handshakes since a dwarf miner's huge big knuckled hand would crush theirs, which if it happened would send the dwarves into fits of laughter. It was all a game to them. So I won't be shaking the hands of any dwarves then. Following a long stint in the mines, the dwarves would come to let off steam by taking part in arm wrestling contests in the noisy taverns of Anvil, risking their hard-earned pay in wages. Most were bad losers, and many a punch was thrown following a loss in a close-fought contest. Travelling merchants avoided the mining town, so the mayor built a permanent market in the town square. She made a deal with the merchants of CAD for Anvil to become the eastern terminus for their trade route ac across the pagan plains. Okay, yeah, I see all that. That's it's all kind of happening around um, this area here, basically. So I think our adventure is going to be focused in this area. Um, the new market quickly became popular for uh, Mrs. Cannoli's wares were... were Tempted many a passing merchant, okay, um, and people from surrounding villages. While some of them would fall foul of a miner's handshake or a sly thief, the market boomed. You are an adventurer who has recently arrived in Anvil to buy a new sword to replace the one you broke, forcing a dungeon door open on a quest to find a treasure chest. The chest contained a map and 50 gold pieces. Oh, hurrah, I've already got money. Look at that. Okay, so let me put that down. I've got a map. And 50 gold pieces. Do I not have 12 iron spikes and 50 feet of rope? Because that seems to be the uh, the adventurer's uh, must must have items before you go on. Uh, you go on any uh, yomping about. Thanks for popping in. Those people that are popping in and popping out, I do appreciate you. Uh, it's Friday night for a lot of people, so uh, you may well be on your way out. Uh, and good for you if you are. Um, you're eager to go on another quest, this time to fire Top Mountain. There were scribblings on the back of the map which described a large quantity of gold concealed in a room by the warlock Zagor, but you dare not venture into the monster-filled passageways beneath fire Top Mountain without a sword, a new sword. Wary of Anvil's thieves, you hide half your gold pieces in your clothing and half inside a secret pocket in your backpack. It is early morning, and you're walking through Anvil's crowded market, looking at the various stalls. You are not alone. The market's busy with people buying cloth, food, spices, weapons, and tools from brightly robed merchants whose shrill cries to attract their customers. Souls here! Buy your souls here! That sort of thing. Unable to find a sword to your liking, you're about to leave the market when you feel a tug on your arm. It's Mrs. Cannoli offering you a steaming pile of cannoli. You enjoy the cannoli and walk on your way. Then there's another tug on your arm and you turn around to see a scrawny one-legged oh, uh, one old man. Oh, that must be Mr. Cannoli. 
in scruffy clothes, peering at you through half-closed eyes, his mouth hanging open. I saw you looking at them swords back there. None took your fancy, did they? He says in a scratchy voice. Maybe I can help. Dunbar, that's my name. And selling is my game. Ha, <laughs> ha, I know someone who has the best swords in town. Much better quality than anything those swindlers from Cat have got to offer. Interested? The old man appears harmless enough, and you tell him to take you to the sword seller. He leads you out of the market and down a narrow street. This is sounding dodgy already. Um, his wooden crutch tapping sharply on the cobblestones. The top floors of the creaking, creaking wooden houses on both sides of the street jut out overhead when you hear a cry of, Look out below! And just you just manage to dodge being drenched by a bucket of dirty water tossed from an upstairs window. Well, you were lucky that was water, mate. Sometimes it is and uh, sometimes it isn't. You know what I mean? <laughs> Dunbar says, chuckling. You pass the locals on their way to the market, but they pay you no attention. Dunbar talks non-stop, telling you in gruesome detail how he lost his leg to a snow wolf on Icefinger Mountain when he was young. You arrive at the shop with heavy wooden shutters pulled back from the window. Here we are, mate. Swords and shields, he announces proudly with a sweeping gesture of the hand. He invites you to go in. Aramax stocks of every type of swords you could ever want. It will see you all right. I'll wait for you outside and trust you'll tip me later. Okay, and that is the beginning of our adventure. So here we go. The small bra brass bell jingles overhead as you walk through the doorway into the shop. Inside, you hit see a huge display of uh, swords and shields. Helpful. Um, on the floor to your left, there's a wooden barrel of spears. On your right, a collection of daggers and axes sticking out of an old tree stump. Wearing leather armour to protect him, a tall man with a flat nose and a thick brown hair is standing behind the counter opposite with his arms folded. He looks at you suspiciously as you enter and reaches down to produce a wooden club from under the counter. You're not from these parts, stranger. How can I help you? He, he asks in a firm voice. That wasn't very firm, was it? It was a bit of a weedy voice. So what do you want to do? Ask him if he knows Dunbar Lap. Tell him that you would like to buy a sword. Jump over the counter and attack him. <laughs> um, well, I don't think I'm going to jump over the counter and attack him. I think I'm going to ask him if he knows Dunbar Lap, first of all. Because uh, it would be good to know if he does know him. Because if he doesn't know him, why did the guy bring me here? 84. The armourer puts down his wooden club. Dunbar Lap, you say? No, never heard of him. Why? You explain that Dunbar Lap brought you to the shop to buy a sword. The man bursts out laughing. Of course I know Dunbar. He's a good man. He brings me lots of customers. Now, this is your lucky day. You are the hundredth customer he's brought me this year, which means you're entitled to a free dagger if, and only if, you buy one of my swords. What do you say? Whilst waiting for your reply, he takes one sword down from the wall and another from under the counter. These are the best I have, he says in a friendly voice. The sword with the engraved blade is the vampire sword, which was designed for slaying the undead. I'm only asking ten gold pieces for it. The sword with the flame-coloured grip is a fire sword, which is best for, fight for fighting fire-breathing creatures. But fifteen gold pieces, it's a bargain. If you want to buy a sword, make your choice. Note the cost in gold pieces on your adventure sheet and turn to 297. If you decide not to buy a sword, turn to 73. Um, well, I think I will buy a sword, but the question is, should I buy a fire sword or one for the undead? Now, seeing as this is called Shadow of the Giants, um, giants are neither undead nor fire breathing creatures. Uh, I mean, there's a dragon on Fire Top Mountain, but I, somehow I think I'm not going to end up going there. Um, I don't know. Chat, what do you think? People watching, uh, fire sword or, or, or the vampire, the vampire sword. Uh, I have 50 gold pieces. Um, so, I mean, I could buy both. I don't know if you can carry two swords, though. Um, I think you can only carry one weapon in this game. You can carry a dagger and a sword. But I think you can only carry one main weapon. 
I believe. And let me just uh, let's have a let me have a look in case I'm wrong about that. Maybe you can carry a backup weapon. I don't know. Um, restoring no, no, no. potions, hints on play, adventure sheet. Okay, adventure sheet. So in our adventure sheet, we've got equipment and treasure, gold, jewels, portions, and provisions. And that's it. Doesn't actually say. Um, I'm going to imagine that. I can probably only carry one. Mikey P's got a suggestion. Denying might be an insult to them. Yeah. Fire sword says says Desert Phoenix. But you would pick the fire sword because you're the Desert Phoenix. Um. Yeah. Now I've lost my. Now I've lost the page I was on. Oh bloody hell! Hold on. Where was I? Which was it? Two one two. Did I say two one two? I think I did say two one two. Um, two one two. Let's have a look. No. Bloody hell! I'm gonna have to go back to the beginning. Lost me. Lost me number, didn't I? Lost me. You know what? Every so often, I'm gonna write the numbers down in the chat because I'm not with a, not with a co-host here. Uh, ask him about Dunbar Lap eighty four. Because these books don't have the nice little lone wolf tassels that you can put in, which keep you keep the page. Right, I'm, I was on 84, okay? I was on 84. So we're just going to put that in the chat. 84, that is not my age for anyone watching. Um, I'm at least, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm younger than that. I'm at least 82. Um, well... Yeah, all right. I'll buy. Let's buy the fire sword. Let's buy the fire sword. That takes me down to 35 pieces, gold pieces. And I've got a fire sword. I mean, will he take anything from my old sword? Probably not. Um, 297. We're going to 297. Americ, thanks you for buying the sword. I think you'll be very happy with your choice. It gives you a shiny dagger, which you tuck into your boots. Uh, you go outside where you find Dunbar Lap waiting for you. He smiles when he sees your sword and cannot conceal his excitement. Are you pleased with your new weapon? He asks enthusiastically. You tell him you're more than happy with the purchase of the gift. You drop two gold pieces in his hand as a tip and wave him goodbye. So that reduces my gold to 33. I don't like the speed in which this is going down. Um, turn to 381. Oh, yeah, thanks, Desert Phoenix. That would be useful. Uh, we've got to go collab on a movie. Yeah, man, for sure. Um, let's do that soon. In fact, I'm doing a watch party of The Longest Day um, in September on a Saturday. I think maybe... That might be the 16th. So if that's if that would interest you, nerdly, you'd be very welcome on it. Doing a top five science fiction movies from 1970 to 1990 next Saturday. But I think that might be full already. But um, let me let me let you know on that one. Or we can just pick one uh, another film and do it ourselves. I'm going to go and see the last Starfighter on the big screen in a couple of weeks okay here we go your thoughts return to firetop mountain and the legendary treasures in hidden inside you are keen to try your luck but you're also aware of the dangers which lie inside the deadly tunnels you reason that it would be better to team up with somebody who has knowledge of the mountain to give you a better chance of survival you decide to see if you can hire a miner to accompany you on your quest and you decide the best place to find dwarves is in a tavern. Tavern. You walk briskly through the back streets, arrive at the name of a tavern called the Double Duck, as in D-U-C-K. Um, you hear a lot of screaming and shouting. You poke your head round the door, and you see a fight going on. Got to show you. I got to show this to you guys. <laughs> see a fight going on. Oh, there we go. There's a there's a fight going on in the in the in the tavern. The dwarves are having a rumble. They're having a rumble in there. Um, 
Two dwarves who are rolling around on the floor, knocking lumps out of each other. The other dwarves in the tavern are swig swigging back tankards of ale and cheering them on. The tall barman suddenly rings a brass bell to end the fight and declare who won. The bruised dwarf stands up and gi they give each other a hug before staggering over to the bar where the winner buys the loser a drink. With order, with order restored, the dwarves sit down at the tables and laugh, uh, joking, recounting tales of their mining explo exploits. One of the dwarves sitting at the nearest table to the door points at you and says, Oi, sunshine, fancy a chance at arm wrestling. Two gold pieces says I can beat you. If you want to accept the challenge, turn to 311. If you would rather sit down at another table, turn to 340. Yeah, I'm not going to accept that challenge because they've got big meaty hands and I've already been warned off doing that. You walk over to, over to an alcove, so I'm on 340 now. You walk over to an alcove at the back of the double duck, sit down opposite two dwarves who are playing a noisy game of dice. The older one with the long beard is accusing the other one of cheating. You cough loudly <laughs> to get their attention. Um, this is really subtle. And introduce yourself by asking either of them, would you like to join me on a treasure hunting exercise to, wall to the fire top mountain? Nowhere dangerous or anything. Um, they put down their dice and say that they are very interested in joining you on your quest. They both claim to have explored the tunnels of Firetop Mountain before. The older dwarf with the ginger hair and the long beard and drooping moustache and ruddy cheeks is called Higley. He tells you he is experienced and trustworthy. He asks for an advance payment of four gold pieces and a share of half the treasures found. The younger dwarf with the long... Uh, brown hair and shorter beard is called Ghibli, who says he's a fearsome fighter and will join you for an immediate payment of two gold pieces plus a third of the treasures treasures found. Um, Higley or Ghibli? I mean, just because somebody tells me they're trustworthy, it doesn't mean that they are, does it? doesn't mean that they are, let's face it. So... Um, I don't know. I think I think the I think the fighter is is better to have. So I'm gonna go with Ghibli, which means I've got to go two zero six, and I have to reduce my gold pieces down to thirty one. So my gold pieces are diminishing quite quite quickly. Uh, the fighter might conserve your stamina exactly. So that's all I'm thinking. Two oh six. Okay, here we go. Um, Higley shrugs his shoulders and says no hard feelings I'm sure Ghibli will serve you well good luck you'll need it and he gets up from the table and sorts over to the bar Ghibli smiles and says don't worry about grumpy old Higley he's just jealous you made the right decision when do you end a set off you reply you'd like to get going as soon as possible Ghibli says that's fine with him as he needs to be back in Anvil the day after tomorrow for a gold mining job you chat about your plan of action over a bowl of thick vegetable soup, <laughs> a specialty of the tavern. Uh, Ghibli wipes his mouth, the back of his sleeve. That was delicious. Now I need to get my axe, backpack and water from bottle from my room. If you give me three gold pieces, two for me and one for some climbing rope, I'll be back in under an hour. Um... It's not giving me the choice not to give him that money. I have to tell you that um, I, um, uh, I, I, my personal decision is, you know, no, I'm not going to give you the money, but I'll wait here um, uh, and uh, for you to come back. Um, so, and, and then I'll give you the money. So, because I'm not going to, I'm not going to give him the money. Um, now it says in the text, um, you give him the gold coins and watch him walk out onto the street. I'm sorry, I'm going to refute that option. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to watch him walk out onto the street without giving him the gold coins. You spend the next hour watching the dwarves arm wrestle and singing. As time pauses, you begin to wonder what happened to Ghibli when Higley strolls over and says, "You're fooling yourself if you think he's coming back." He'll be down in mines by now. This is not the first time he's run off with someone's money. You can hardly believe what Higley tells you. If you want to wait a bit longer for Ghibli, turn to 41. If you want to hire Higley instead, turn to 128. Um, uh, 
Good question. Good question. I wouldn't be surprised if he has run off. Um, but he's only got two gold pieces because, as I said to you, I'm uh, not going to. Um, I'm not going to uh, give that guy any money. Um, if you'd rather give up on him and hire Higley instead, turn a one to it. Yeah, okay. Well, he's not going to come back, is he? So let's let's do that. Higley holds out his hand for you to count out the gold coins. Um, oh yeah, it's four. So I'm now down to 27. Fire top man and awaits us. I'm ready to go when you are. He grabs his axe, a coil of rope, backpack from behind the bar, and follows you out of the tavern. You tell Higley that you want to set off immediately, but he says he never goes treasure hunting without first going to see Mystic Mary. Mystic Mary, okay. Mystic Meg, the local soothsayer who, who gives him help, helpful advice. If you want to visit the soothsayer, go to 247. If you'd rather leave without further delay, go to 191. Um, all right, no, we'll go with the soothsayer. Why not? I'm not in a rush anyway. Um, it's not like there's a kingdom being besieged. 247, 247. Okay, so we're on 247 now, guys. 247. I feel like I'm churning through the, the pages in this a lot faster than Lone Wolf. Higley leads you through the back streets of Anvil before turning down a narrow alley. You grip the hilt of your sword, wary he might be leading you into a trap, but your fears are sooner laid when there's a small house at the end of the alley which has a door with the words Mystic Mary on it. Um, I have to say that Mystic Mary is uh, rather hot. I'm going to have a picture of her here. She's, uh, hang on, wait, there we are. There she is. Mystic Mary with a cat. She's got a cat. Um, Higley opens the door walks in without waiting to be asked you follow him inside the small room when you see a young woman with long hair sitting in a rocking chair stroking a black cat on her lap in front of an open fireplace wearing a long black dress and has a red shawl wrapped around her neck she looks out of the corner of her eyes with a hint of a smile welcome I believe you are here to seek words of wisdom regarding a quest that you're about to embark upon. If that is indeed the case, please drop one gold piece into my little friend here. She points at the ceramic money box. Um, it's in the shape of a pig with a coin slot in the back. If you want to put a gold coin in the box, turn to 112, or you can leave straight away. Well, might as well. I'm spending money rapidly here, but so we're going to 112. Going to 112. One, two. Mary closes her eyes and begins to stroke her cat very gently as she, recite, as she recites a short mime in a barely audible whisper. The eyes of the dragon are the gems on its head. Green is life and red is dead. She opens her eyes again, smiles and says, good luck on your adventure. Higgly thanks her for her help and leaves the hut. You follow him outside going, dude, what the? <laughs> no, it doesn't say that in the book, but that's what I'm saying right now. Um, ask him what dragon eyes have got to do with the Firetop Mountain. He shrugs and says, who knows, but I'm sure Mary's rhyme will aid us on our quest. So if we ever have a choice between green and red, we pick green. And the eyes of the dragon are the gems on its head. Um, if, so if we ever need some gems and we take them out of the dragon statue, you repeat the rhyme, you memorize it and leave Anvil to begin your treasure hunting quest. Turn to 191. This is very d d isn't it? You know, going on an adventure, want to get some treasure, kill a dragon or two. Have sword, will travel. You head east, excited, chatting excitedly about Higley, about treasure hunting. Ahead of you, you see the ominous fire red peak of by top mountain its menacing steep face strewn with sharp crags of rock jutting out from it as you approach the mountain you see the cave entrance ahead ha ah, here we are higgly calls out loudly he pulls his axe from his belt steps into the gloom the walls inside the cave are slimy and there are pools of dank water on the floor which give the air a musty smell you set off down a passageway and at the back of the cave you soon come to a junction which higgly um you ask higgly 
which way you should go. And he replies that going left is pointless since treasure hunters have long since looted everything in that section of the mountain. You turn right and notice a small hole in the wall, peer into the cavity, but it's too dark to see what is inside. If you want to reach into the hole, turn to one, two, turn to 12. If you'd rather walk on, go to 49. Reach into the hole or continue. Sounds a bit ominous. I don't know about reaching into the hole. Um, it might activate some kind of trap. Uh, I'm not going to put my hand in there. Screw that. 49. Let's keep going. Um, it might activate a trap. You soon arrive at a wooden door which has been smashed open and hangs in pieces on rusty hinges. You peer into the gloom and see a clay pit just beyond the doorway. Higley ties one end of his climbing rope on the door hinge before throwing it down the pit. He grins and says, I'll go first, grabs the rope to slide down the pit. Nothing to see down here, he says, looking up. You tell him not to be so hasty and you slide down the rope to join him. <laughs> Two of us in the pit, really? Um, you inspect the pit wall carefully and notice a faint vertical crack in the clay. You tell Higley to swing his axe at the wall and hear a dull clang as the blade strikes solid metal. You help him clear away the clay to reveal an iron door, which is etched with figures of fire-breathing dragons. Two sex. Uh, I'll we'll keep talking. Um, fire-breathing dragons. Higley urges caution, but you cannot resist trying the handle. Much to your surprise, it turns. Well, that's a relief. Um, uh, you enter a small stone wall chamber where you see an ancient wooden chest with thick brass edging on a marble plinth. Although it's quite dark inside the chamber, you can see that the far wall is decorated with colourful paintings of an old bearded wizard, sounds like you, Desert, in long robes, holding a glass orb from which swelling gases are escaping. A huge dragon appears to be materialising from the gases. This could be a painting of Zagor, the evil warlock who used to live inside the mountain, Higley says excitedly. And this could be his long-lost treasure chest. You walk round the plinth looking for traps before inspecting the chest, which has two rows of interlocking dragon teeth securing the lid to the frame of the chest. You can't find a lock, but there are two gemstone eyes, one emerald, and one ruby set in the lid, which is shaped like the top of a dragon's skull. Higgily suggests you should try pressing one of the gems, which might open the chest. Well, emerald, because red is dead, isn't it? We established that earlier. So the emerald one, 327. It's nice the way he lets me do that. So going to 327. You hear a faint click when you press the small emerald eye and watch the lid lift open like a huge mouth. Uh, on a velvet red cushion inside, you see a polished iron crown adorned with four iron warriors spaced equally apart on the rim. The warriors are all standing to attention with their hands resting on the hilt of their downward pointing swords. What a fantastic looking crown, exclaims Hig Higgly. Must have magical powers. I'm going to put it on. If you want to let Higgly try the crown on, Turn to 166. If you'd rather try it on for yourself, turn to 2887. You could test your luck. And if you're lucky, turn to 351. Unlucky, turn to 224. Um, I feel testing my luck might be a good idea here. So I'm going to do that. Because each time I test my luck, it gets reduced by one. Um, but we'll give it a go. So my camera back on there we are okay um so i'm going to roll 2d6 and i need to get seven or under seven or under on this one new new, new. six now if we can no i thought i clicked if i clicked on that it goes up to two doesn't it no okay thought i had that sussed but uh, apparently not. Let me try left-clicking. 
No. Uh, hold on. Okay, that's weird. I th might have to roll a D12 instead. Do we have a D12? Uh, I don't think we do. Got D10, D20, D12. We do have a D12. All right. We have a D12. I failed. Failed my luck test. Reduce your luck by one. Turn to two, two, four. That's not good, is it? Hang on. Is that right? Doesn't sound right. Um, oh, that's wrong. I, you're not allowed to test your luck here. That's actually 328. So I, I wasn't able to do that. Um, so um, all, I, all I'm able to do, in fact, is either try the crown on myself or let Higley try on the crown. So, okay, so we're not in a die rolling situation. My bad. I misread that. That's why when I turn to the next chapter it didn't make any sense i was reading it i was like that hasn't just happened by the way there's a uh, image of the uh chest here uh, which is that so that's the chest we're trying to open uh how are we doing for time coming up to eight o'clock i'm gonna probably keep playing till about eight thirty. i think i'm getting a bit hungry and uh feeling quite fatigued so um, don't think my health is too good at the moment, sadly. Um, um, so, if you want to let Higley try on the crown, yeah, if you look at the book, um, what I missed was, um, this is this uh, this is the, this, these are the options here. And then I thought it continued up to here on the next page. And I thought that was the page number, but that's actually the next option. So this test your luck thing, is not part of that section. So we are, yeah, we're, we're still on 327. That's right, Desert Phoenix. So I'm going to let him try on the crown, and that's 166. What? That was my instinct, actually, anyway. Fortune favours the brave, Higley says cheerfully, places the crown on his head. You watch him lift the velvet cushion out of the chest in the hope of finding more treasure, but there's nothing else inside. Might as well take these gems, he says, drawing his dagger. He begins to prise the ruby out of the eye socket when suddenly he drops the, the dagger. He looks alarmed, grabs the crown with both hands. It, it, it's crushing my head, he says with a fearful look in his eyes. He tugs at the crown but is unable to take it off even with your help. The help It tightens even more around his head, causing him considerable pain. But he manages to climb out of the pit and stagger outside, still pulling on the ground, crown before collapsing on the ground. Daylight has activated the evil magic in a spell that was cast on the Iron Crown years ago. It drops off Higley's head and rolls away as if being controlled. You watch him incredulous, you watch on incredulously as the four Iron Warriors on the rim come alive. They jump down from the crown onto the ground to stand at attention in a circle, swords raised, raised and tips touching. They grow quickly and within seconds they're tearing above you like a group of five meter high iron statues. Although unable to see you, the iron giants sense your present presence. They turn their heads towards you in unison. That's pretty creepy. Roll two dice. If the number rolled is equal than or uh, is less than or equal to your skill score. Turn to one four six. Um, I think my skill score is twelve, so I think um, it's an automatic win for me uh, when I check my skill. I'm a little bit miffed that I seem to have um, not got my 
ability to oh for god's sake i lost it again um i thought i'd sussed out how to do two dice by just simply clicking on the the thing but that's not the case so uh, okay so i can okay i can roll two dice easily enough i just click on it and then, then rolls another one um well i roll a seven so I, I i make it no problem um but my skill score is 12 so that there's no way i wouldn't have made it anyway so i don't even think i needed to make that die roll i think it's woods automatically so less or equal to your skill turn to one four six one four six yeah, I feel thin, Gandalf, like butter spread over too much bread. All right, one, four, six, here we go. Um, you drive sideways and just manage to avoid... What do you mean I dive? Oh, I dive sideways, not drive. I thought I was in a four by four or something. And just manage to avoid being hit by the sword. You jump and run back into the cave to escape the Iron Giants. Looking out from the safety of the cave entrance, you watch until they grow to stand some 10 metres tall. Without warning, they all turn round at the same time and slowly stride off. Ah, oh, right. These might be the, sh the giants on the front of the book. And slowly stride off west towards the pagan plains, their giant articulated limbs making grating metallic sounds as they walk and their thumping of iron feet crushing anything in their path underfoot. As soon as they're gone, you run outside to where Higley is lying motionless on the ground, barely alive. It's a crown of chaos. I'm doomed, he whispers, struggling to breathe, his face contorted in pain. The iron giants will destroy Annalisa. Take the crown to Marek Yash in Hamlin. He will help you. The magic items you'll need to find in Hamlin are here. But before he can find, finish his sentence, Higley falls silent, his eyes to close, never to open again. They will look for his coming at the White Tower, but he will not return. Um, uh, uh, right, okay. You look, so you place the crown in your backpack and set off towards Hamlin. You look back momentarily to see the iron giants marching slowly on, towering above the trees. An hour later, you arrive at the Red River, where you see an old man with a wizened, wizened, wizened face lying asleep in a rowing boat, which has been pulled up on the bank. If you want to talk to the old man, go to 215. If you'd rather keep on walking, go to Riverbank. Okay, so quite a lot's happened there. Um, let's write a couple of things down. We've got to take the town to Marek Um Yash. So I'm going to write that, that name down. Let's get the map back up again. Um, yeah, I don't think I'll play this too much longer because I am feeling a bit wonky. That's why I didn't go out tonight. Uh, right, so uh, notes. Okay, let's get, get into our notes here. So... Marek Yom Ash is this guy that we need to find. Um, take the crown to Marek on Ash in Hamlin. Hamlin, Hamlin. Where is that on here? Let's have a look on this map. Let's see if we can see it. So we were in Anvil. Oh, Hamelin is the other side of Firetop Mountain in the Moonstone Hills, just below Cape Pong, um, just north of the Forest of Spiders. Okay. Wow. That's a, that's a hike, that. That's a hike. Um, okay. Well, we could travel along the river. Is that where we are now? Because if we go with the old man along the river to Zengis, that would take us pretty close to ha Hamelin. Um, all right. At Hamelin. Hamelin. Okay, so... 
I've got the crown of chaos in my possession. Not really sure I want it. Crown of chaos. Um, and we've activated five iron giants that are now going to run rampant around the countryside and kill things. Um, I arrive at the Red River. Now, I don't know if that's the river at the south of Firetop Mountain or if which um, goes into the Darkwood Forest um, or if it's it's not the River Cock, which is at the top. Oh, I see Red River. Yeah, the Red River's just south of Stonebridge. So that must be the one that, yeah, that's the one that runs along the bottom of Firetop Mountain. Okay, so I'm already, I'm already by that river. Well, I'll speak to the guy because maybe he can take the boat upriver for me. Um, might be rowing against the tide, but it's probably worth doing. Okay, so to talk to the old man, you turn to 215. So we're going to 215. 215. You cough loudly <clears throat> and wake up the old man who looks startled. He grabs an oar and tells you not, not to come any closer. You ask if you ask if you can hire him to row you to Hamlin. Take two five seven. Draw your sword or apologize for waking him up and walk on. Well, if I'm going to apologize for waking him up and walking on, um, it's hardly worth it, is it? Okay, I'm on I'm on two fifteen now, so I'm just going to pop that in the chat. Um, uh, I will. Uh, I'm going to ask him if uh, he's up for being hired. Two five seven. I've got some money. Rapidly diminishing pile of money, but I got a little bit. The old man relaxes and says, Hamlin is too far away for me to row to. In the old days, I used to run a ferry service across an underground river inside Firetop Mountain, but people stopped coming. I've retired now, but I'll sell you my boat if that's of interest. Pay me five gold pieces and it's yours. If you want to buy the ferryman's rowboat, turn to 360, or you'd rather decline his offer and walk on. I don't want to take the, the river into Firetop Mountain. I mean, I'd rather just go round it. Um, yeah, I'm not going to take the boat. I'm going to walk on, I think. Going to walk on. Um, 58. So I'm returning to 58. The light of the lance and star is fading. Yeah, I know the truth. It's not long before you come to an old log cabin, which has a small vegetable patch in front of it. Smoke drifts up from the chimney, and you see there are two saddled horses tethered to a post nearby. If you want to knock on the door of the cabin, Turn to 388. If you'd rather keep going and walking along the riverbank, turn to 6. So, I mean, the, the potential here is to get a horse. Um, yeah, knock on the cabin door, I think. Knock on the cabin door, 388, 383, 388, 388. Knock on the cabin door. You walk up to the front door of the cabin. You bang on it with the pummel of your sword. You hear dogs barking. Go away or I'll set my dogs on you. And a man angrily calls out. If you want to knock on the door again, turn to one, two, one. If you'd rather continue walking along the riverbank. Fuck it. I'm going to knock again. I'm going to knock again. I'm annoyed now. Everybody's so grumpy around here. Um, it's urgent. Urgent business. There's giants wandering around the mountain. You knock rapidly on the door and hear the man call out, Did you not hear me? I said, Go away or I'll set the dogs on you. If you want to ask if you can buy one of his horses, turn to 348. I do. So we're going to 348. Because um, otherwise, this is pointless. Door is suddenly yanked open. Oh my God, here he is. He looks proper mean, too. Look at this guy. <laughs> nice artwork, by the way, uh, in this book. Very nice. Very nice art. I like this artwork. It's fantastic. I don't think that that's ian jacks ian livingston that draws those i'll just have, we'll have a quick look to see who that is um who uh it's three four eight we're on yeah three four eight yeah um and let me just check to see about the artwork i'm, I'm curious to know um So 
So, by the way, this is a London company. Uh, maybe Ian Livingston is. I always thought Steve Jackson was American. Ian Livingston, I think, is the British guy. Um, cover, in, cover and inside illustrations by Mike McCarthy. Map illustration by Rian McGee. So, Mike McCarthy, I do like your artwork, sir. My compliments to you. The door is suddenly yanked open by a grime, grim-faced skinny man with a bushy beard and wiry hair sticking out all over the place. He's wearing a grubby shirt tucked into his baggy trousers, which are held up by a leather belt um, with a dragon's head around that. Why has everybody got dragon's heads? What's up with dragon's heads? Two slavering warhounds with sharp fangs stand by his side, barking loudly, straining at the leash, wild-eyed, ready to attack. The man looks up and down and says, why didn't you say you wanted to buy a horse in the first place? My name is ha Harold Hoggett, and my playful little puppies here are called Chulia and Jorg. Don't worry, they won't attack unless I tell them to. Where are you heading to? If you want to reply that it's none of his business, turn to 200. If you want to reply Hamelin, turn to 34. I think I'll be polite and go for 34. don't want to say it's none because he might attack me. But then he might attack me anyway. Um, Aimlin, what takes you to the town of the tricksters? Must be something important. If you want to ask him if he's heard of Marek Omyash, turn to 333. If you reply that you are looking for magic items, turn to 293. Um, oh, I'm going to ask him if he's heard of this guy, 333. So we're going to 333. I feel like I'm only a second away from being attacked with this guy. Hoggett offers you a chair before sitting down on an old threadbed armchair with the dogs lying at his feet. Yes, I do know Marek. Why do you want to see him? If you want to tell Hoggett about the crown of chaos and the iron giants, turn to 262. If you want to say you're an old friend of his, um, I'm going to tell him about the giants. This, All these decisions seem wrong, but for, I'm just going to be frank with this guy. You show Hoggett the crown of chaos and you tell him you came to find it in Firetop Mountain and how the Iron Giants rose up and headed west. You tell him what Higley said before he died about you having to find Marek, but that you didn't know why you should find him or exactly where to find him. Hoggett looks up in shock that the Iron Giants have risen. This is disastrous news. Um, had he lived, Paul Higley would have told you that Marek is one of only a handful of people in Alan's, uh, Alancia who knows how to defeat an Iron Giant. What Higley didn't know is that ever since his wife, Velma, died, Marek has lived as a recluse in Hamelin. He refuses to see anybody these days. Now, I met him years ago when I fought shoulder to shoulder against the Lizardmen in the Battle of Fire Island, and we became brothers. But if you wear this, I know he will speak to you. Hoggett takes off his chain necklace. Oh, so this was well worth pursuing with this guy. And hands it to you. There's a silver medallion hanging from it with a dragon's head. Of course, of course it's a dragon's head. Show him this medallion. Tell him Harold Hoggett says hello. He says calmly. Marek will be likely wearing the same medallion. Now, look, you must be on your way. The fate of Alancia is in your hands. There's no time to lose. Save your gold. Take my horse with my compliments. I will join you, but I'm frail, and I have my dogs and horses to look after. Right, well, that was that was good. It was good I pursued. It felt like they were all the wrong decisions. It felt like he was going to attack me, uh, but... Um, uh, after all of that, it was all good. Now, so I've got a medallion with a dragon's head on it. Medallion with dra dragon's head. People are shouting in my street. Um, three, four, four. Okay, what's the time? I'm going to carry on a little bit longer. Let's get the map back up again. I think people can only see, people can only handle my face in all its glory for a limited period of time without the use of dark glasses. Okay, so. 344. We're going to 344. <laughs> ah, uh, I don't know this person, but Cat Bahoy, welcome to the channel. Not sure I trust Hoggett. Uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, not sure I trust him either, but uh, he did give me a he gave me a horse for free, so um, you know it's not too bad. Um, 
Hog it goes outside and unties the reins of a sleek chestnut horse called Willow. He helps you up onto the saddle and says, out of respect for Marrick, I suggest you pay a visit to the graveyard outside Hamlin. His wife is buried there. By the way, it's the first day of unlocking tomorrow, which means the Hamlet Fair will be on. There'll be entertainers, stalls, contests, and all manner of fun things happening. You never know. Marrick on Yash might sneak out for a while. It was always his favourite day, but watch out for hustlers, especially card sharks, or card sharks, as they're called here. Uh, they'll rob you of your gold before you know it. Thank Hoggett for his help. He shakes your hand before giving the willow a slack, slap on the rump and sending him on his way. You'll gallop across the grasslands, following the river, on through a grove when you see a bearded man who's tied up to an oak, old oak tree. He's wearing a leather waistcoat and has a leather headband to keep his long hair out of his eyes. When he sees you, he calls out, begging you to stop. You bring Willow to a halt and trot over to the oak tree, looking around to make sure it's not a trap. My name is Victor, he replies desperately. Uh, I was on my way from Zengris to the Moonstone Hills when these three goblins jumped out on me from behind the trees. Um, I don't know what accent that is, but it's working for me. Um, they, took they took everything I had. Now please untie me and I will be forever in your debt. Mm, if you want to help the man, turn to 220 if you'd rather ride on. Um... Oh, fuck it. I'll help him. 220. 220. I've already, like, taken a risk with one grumpy man, but uh, here. You jump down from your horse. You untie the unfortunate adventurer. He thanks you over and over again. Those greasy goblins stole everything. I have nothing to reward you with except for this lucky charm, Victor says, pulling a wooden button off his waistcoat and handing it to you. You see, it's carved in the shape of a clover leaf. The button is a magic charm which you can use once to make uh, you automatically lucky if you choose it instead of testing your luck. You thank Victor for the gift. Oh, well, that's useful. Um, I'll put that in my items. Lucky charm. Forgo luck roll. Okay. All right, cool. Um, yeah, we're on 220. Thank you, uh, Phoenix. You thank Victor for the gift and off him ride on the back of your horse to Hamelin, but he says he must get to the Moonstone Hills as soon as possible. You bid him farewell and you gallop off 134. Glad that wasn't a trap. Felt like it could have been. It's late afternoon by the time you see the small town of Hamelin in the distance. So we are now here, more or less. So here, we're here, more or less. Okay. Um, a woman wearing brown. Hang on. Ahead of you, you see a small jetty. It's late afternoon by the time you see the small town of Hamelin in the distance on the other side of the river. Ahead of you, you see a small jetty to which a wooden raft is moored. A young woman wearing brown breeches and a baggy white shirt is sitting on a bench at the end of the jetty, busy casting a fishing line into the water. She turns round when your horse winds. You notice she has an angry scar running the length of her face and a patch over her eye. My kind of woman. She stands up and says, the fishing is good today, but I'm not in the mood to run my ferry service. My name is Rosa. If you want me to take you across the river, it's going to cost you 10 gold pieces, or I'll take your horse for, in payment if you have no need for it. If you want to pay Rosa 10 gold pieces, or if you want to give her the horse... So 280195. Well, probably don't need the horse anymore. So I think I'll give the horse 195. You're feeling a little sad about leaving Willow, but Rosa assures you that he will be well fed and looked after and sent to the knacker's yard. She ties the horse to the handrail on the jetty and invites you on to the raft. You step on board and watch her take a long wooden pole and push off the bank. Uh, plunging the pole into the fast flowing water, she pushes against the riverbed, effortlessly drives the raft across the river in just a few minutes. Jump onto the woody wooden jetty on the south bank and watch Rosa start her return journey. You walk towards Hamlin, you which you see is a small town with overhanging timber framed houses and some taller buildings from the centre. To your right, there are farm workers toiling away in the in the fields, digging up carrots and potatoes and loading them onto carts. 
There's an old graveyard to your left with weathered gravestones. Um, in rows surrounding a large vine-covered stone tomb. Will you look at the gravestones, examine the tomb, walk straight into Hamelin? Now, it was advised that I should pay respect to uh, this guy's wife, uh, Mark Yom Ash's widow or uh, wife, deceased. Let's look at the gravestones. 189. When it says examine the tomb, does it mean rob the tomb? Because I, I don't want to do that. Grave is neglected and overgrown with weeds and ivy. Several gravestones are broken. Um, you pass by three marble headstones that were laid in more recent times and are still legible. The first is that of Indigo Asgard, a pig farmer who died at the age of 42. The second pays tribute to Rivera Knopf, a violin maker who was 61 when she died. And the third headstone is to Velma Om Yash, a basket weaver who died age 43. If you have not done so already, you can examine the tomb. If you'd like to walk to Hamelin, go to 26. All right, let me look at the tomb, 86. I'm examining the tomb. That does not mean I'm going to rob the tomb. I, I reserve the right to refuse to do that and uh, turn back. Tomb is built of sandstone, which has turned black over time. There are carved stone gargoyles on each of the four corners of the flat roof and broken steps which lead down to a wooden door almost hidden by thick vines you walk down the steps and cut away the vines with your sword to reveal a handle which turns in your hand the door is wedged shut shut blocked at the bottom by dirt and debris but you managed to barge it open i said i was going to examine the tomb i did not say i was going to raid the tomb i knew it was going to make me do this you stare into the musty smelling tomb, your eyes trying to adjust near the darkness. You step inside and walk towards the sarcophagus, which lies in the middle of the tomb. See, now I'm robbing the tomb. I said examining the tomb and robbing the tomb and not the same thing. You feel a cold draft of wind on your neck and spin round to see a shadowy figure in a long ragged black gown hovering above the cold stone floor. Its face, uh, but for its glowing red eyes, is hidden by a large hood. Welcome. I waited a long time for this moment says in a hissing whisper. Vicious long claws suddenly appear from out of its baggy sleeves as the wraith glides towards to attack you. You draw your sword to defend yourself. If you possess a vampire sword, add two to your attack. So, uh, Phoenix, as we know, I do not possess a vampire sword. I possess a fucking dragon sword or whatever it's called, the fire sword. So the wraith has skill of 10. I have skill of 12. It has stamina of eight. Attacks, attack, uh, if you win, turn to one, five, nine. Right, so one, five, nine, if we win. If we win, just pop that in the chat. Um, and uh, now I've got to remind myself how the combat works again. Okay, battles, here we go. So roll two dice for, you, for your enemy and add the total to its skill score. Um, so it's got skill of 10, and that's your enemy's attack strength. Roll two for yourself. And, okay, uh, well, we're going to do D10s on this, uh, I think, um, because, uh, or d twelve. sorry, because um, that's going to be easier for me. Um, so I'm just going to do D12s as I, I, don't, I don't know what happened to this. I prefer rolling 2D6s. Oh, hang on a second. One, two, two. Let me, let me do it. Hang on. Let me, I think I'm, maybe I know how to do this now. Let me do that. No, I don't want a hidden die roll. Please. Um, plus. No. Not that one. Not that one. Plus. No. No. Ah. Uh, okay. All right, we're gonna do we're gonna do a D12 because I I just can't seem to get this thing to cooperate with me. All right, okay. So we're gonna do a D12. This is my first combat of the game. So um, we're gonna we're gonna share my die roll thing. I'm gonna have to use a D12 rather than two D6, which I think is okay, but it's not quite in the spirit of the game. Um, all right, so. Uh, 
we add our enemy's attack strength. Um, it's 10, and then we add 12 to my die roll. Okay, so this is the enemy's die roll. Five, so with that gives him 15. And then we're going to do my die roll. Eight, I've beat him. So um, he's taken two points of damage. I've taken nothing. Okay, and that's the first round of combat over. And I think that's... Um, I'm not going to use my luck to do any additional damage. If the enemy's wounded you... All right, okay. So, yeah, he's taken... So he's down to eight. All right, so we're going to go again. Um, I did my die roll first because if I get a high die roll, he can't beat me. So then it's pointless rolling his. Uh, that gives me 17. It's possible for him to beat me. So let's see what he gets. That is a six. Uh, so that's him on 16, 17. I beat him. I did two damage. He's down to six stamina. Okay, we're going again, round three. I'll do my die roll first again. That's a nine. That puts me on 21. Um, let's do him. That's an eight. Um, no, so I've beaten him again. Okay, fourth round of combat. Me first. That's a seven. He's he's beaten again. Okay, uh, and if I win this one, I'm going to kill him. I got an eight. He got a nine, but he needs. I'm still two above him because I'm on twenty, and that puts him on nineteen. So I win the combat. He has died. So we're going to one five nine, and I think I might take a break there, and I might pause this. Um, all that remains of the wraith is the long gown lying crumpled in, in the stone floor. If you want to open the sarcophagus, turn to 365. If you're not, have it. I might as well look at the sarcophagus now because now I've endured all this ne unnecessary combat. Let's have a look and see what's in here. I feel like I've un rather unwittingly become a grave robber. You grip the sarcophagus lid and push it all the way with your weight. You see a skeleton lying inside encased in a suit of plate mail armour. The body armour appears to be too big for you, but the gauntlet on the skeleton's right hand looks like it could be a fit. There's also a leather pouch clutched in the fingers of the skeleton's left hand and a sword with a claw-shaped pommel on its right. Do you want to take the pouch, take the sword, try on the gauntlet? I'm going to take the pouch... See what's in the pouch. I don't know about the sword or the or the gauntlet, but um, take the pouch. Pouch is probably got money in it, so let's have a look. Hundred turns up. So, so we're going to one hundred. Turning to one hundred. Um, you want to curl the skeleton's brittle fingers. Um, and take the pouch. It feels like it contains some metal objects. If you want to open the pouch, go to one seven one. If you do not wish to open the pouch. Um, and you've not done so already, you may take the sword or try on the gauntlet, or you may leave the tomb. It's giving me a lot of... It's giving me a lot of... Um, uh, moments where I can say no, which which makes me think, should I be doing this? I am being a grave robber at the minute. Not a, uh, not a nice thing. I, I think I'll... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take the... Um, I'll, I'll open the pouch. You untie the string binding and pull the contents of the pouch into your hand. Nesting in the palm of your hand are three small human-shaped skulls. One made of gold, one made of silver, and one made of brass. There's also three bones, perhaps from a bird. You put the objects back in the pouch and decide what to do next. If you've not done so already, you may try on the gauntlet, leave the tomb, or head straight into Hamlin. Yeah, okay, well, I'm going into Hamlin now. I'm going to sod this tomb. I'm getting out of here, 26. Let's get into this town and then we'll 
Okay, going into town 26. Okay, so we're going to end it there because this is a huge section and I'm, I'm knackered. Um, not feeling too too wonderful. So 26 is where we got to. I'm just going to turn the corner of the page down. I know some people think that's sacrilege, but there we are. I tweaked the nose of terror. So um, I'm going to put that in the chat as well. We ended, we, we've got to 26. Um, uh, Desert Phoenix has done it for me as well. So that is part one of Shadow of the Giants. Uh, what do I think of this? It's the first time I've played Finding Fantasy. Um, I mean, it, it, it's a lot more basic in terms of the um, back backstory and world building because, yeah, okay, you're an adventurer, you've got a sword, you want to get some treasure. Whereas, whereas Lone Wolf, you have a whole story, you've got a whole backstory, your character's got history, especially if you've played it from the beginning. Um, ah, uh, Cat Pihoy, thanks, <clears throat> thanks for popping on, and please do look out for more of these because I'm going to play them all. Um, <clears throat> um, but I liked it; it was fun, it was fun because it moves a bit faster. It's a bit, you know, and you've got lots of choices, lots of choices. Um, Lone Wolf can feel a bit linear at times. It's like, do you have this skill? If you do, then turn to this page and this is going to happen rather than do you want to make choices? Um, so I feel that the choices are a bit more, uh, a bit less linear here. Um, but the world building of Lone Wolf has always been what has appealed to me. But I'm going to, I'll play, I'll play the second part of this probably at a random time um, next week. Um, I do also have the secrets of Salamonis, uh, which I do plan on playing as well at some point. It's got a mutant piranha on the front for some reason. I don't, I don't know why that is. Um, yeah, it's good that I didn't go out tonight because I, I don't feel good. Um, so um, thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, if you haven't been on the channel before, there's a lot of other content. There's a lot of film reviews and that kind of thing, but there's also... Because I work in the um, creative industry, there are also lots of interviews with lots of people that do lots of different jobs in the industry, and there's lots more of those coming. And I've got two actors I'm interviewing this month. Uh, Tim Thomason of Trancers and Uncommon Valor fame. He's coming on on the 12th of September. And the very day after him, on the 13th of September, I have Danny Mosley from Dreaming Whilst Black coming on the ch channel. So... Um, if you're a fan of either of those actors from dead from totally different decades, Danny is a young and upcoming actor. Tim has retired now, but they're both going to have great stories to tell. So you're going to want to check out those interviews. In the meantime, um, thanks very much for tuning in to my impromptu Friday night gaming stream. I'm going to do a quick bit of editing and, and make sure this is in the right folder so people can find it. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm due to come back on and do a stream. I think it's on Sunday night. I think I might be back on on either Sunday or Monday. Um, but don't forget, next week I've got streams on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, I'm always doing a stream Tuesday night unless I'm going out. So you can always find me doing something on Tuesday evening, um, Tuesday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday. And Wednesday tend to be my core streaming nights. Sometimes I do Sundays. Sometimes I do a big one on Saturday night. Uh, we've got the longest day coming up. Next Saturday, I'm doing top top, top five sci-fi films from 1970 until 1990. So that's going to be a good one. And we're doing a watch party of the longest day later in September on a Saturday. So loads of stuff happening with the channel. Really enjoyed doing this. So do like and subscribe and share and uh, help me get my subscribers up because uh i've got big plans and uh that's going to be a big help all right thanks a lot guys see you again soon